Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Pastor Smith, First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I think we're a couple minutes late here tonight, but I want to welcome everyone here tonight. <clears throat> Broadcasting on Facebook our, our Thursday evening Bible study, uh, starting at uh, 7 o'clock here tonight. Anyway, we want to welcome everyone. We, we're thankful that we sort of escaped a, a ice storm that could have caused a lot of power outage. So we've been very fortunate. We're just on the very uh, skirts of it, and so we escaped any real damage or anything. In fact, we didn't have any in my area. We didn't have any ice on the roads uh, or anywhere else as far as that's concerned. Just cold weather, a little bit of damp, but it never did freeze. Uh, so anyway, we're thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate everyone tonight. I hope that uh, those of you who have been sick are feeling better. And um, um, I don't know about Sunday service. I'm a little bit worried that uh, they're talking about snow and ice. So we just have to watch it, but we'll certainly let everyone local know um, about the weather for this coming weekend. Anyway, I want to welcome Brother Fidel from Guatemala City, Guatemala, and looks like uh, mostly just the family, local folks for right now. <clears throat> I'm sure others will get on here in just a little while. Um I, um, I'm considering, you know, um, I had several questions from, uh, <clears throat> the Dominican Republic and people from Mexico also, um, uh, that we dealt with, uh, on Monday night at our Zoom meeting, a regular weekly Zoom meeting, um, well, uh, let me just look here a second and see. Um, one person wanted me to say something about how God is the head of every man, uh, how Christ <clears throat> is the head of every man. In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, I've been over that um, at home a few times, but, you know, I might just briefly mention it. <clears throat> uh, you know, it would be uh, ludicrous to believe that Jesus, you know, talks to each man individually and that he's head that way. If you look at the early church, uh, the Apostle Paul said to, in his letter to the Corinthians that, the, the, that there's firstly apostles, secondarily prophets, and thirdly teachers. <clears throat> he gave the order of the ministry back there. Someone mentioned to me that, um, you know, that there are men that believe that we don't need any uh, apostles. Uh in the body of Christ down here in the end of the Gentile world or, and, um, you know, I, I mentioned to them, I said, well, stop and think about it. You know, um, there, you really don't have any information of several of the apostles that were apostles over the Jewish church in the body of Christ in the end of the Jewish world and what we would call the early church. Um, for example, Matthew. I don't think you know anything about Matthew outside of the, the letter he wrote in the, in the uh, gospel of Matthew, which was just a, uh, a historical <clears throat> writing of what Jesus did while he was here on the earth, his account of it. And then uh, Andrew, a 
with Peter's brother. What do you know about Andrew? What do you know about what he done or what he said? I mean, how what would he as an apostle benefit us? Um, those men were apostles back there and we have very little information whatsoever. We've got like the first, what is it, seven chapters of the book of Acts. It was history um, of the early church. But then when it we begin to hear about Saul of Tarsus and all the writings of the New Testament is uh, in the book of Acts when Saul was converted and uh, what took place in Saul's ministry and his missionary journeys and then <clears throat> the writings of Paul. Um, you know, his name was changed from Saul of Tarsus to Paul. And um, so... Um, he was, uh, then, then Peter, both of Peter's letters, I won't take time to go into it now, but I can show you by the contents of his letter that they were written to Paul's churches after Paul's, uh, <clears throat> death. Peter was, was taking care of Paul's works and helping them and writing letters to them. And then, of course, James, he did write a letter to the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and, <clears throat> but, I mean, what, you know, and then John. John, he also wrote his account in the Gospel of John, St. John. But then his three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, was written basically to the Gentile church. Um, or as the body as a whole, but it was basically going out to the Gentiles. Uh, and then, of course, the book of Revelation was uh, to the Gentile church also and uh, reaches all the way down here to our time. So we really don't have much information of those nine other apostles and what they did and, and uh, their, the, the acts or works of the apostles among the Jews. God had the New Testament written primarily for Gentiles. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, it would be ludicrous to believe that we didn't, that we were supposed to have a restored church that would be just like the early church and it didn't have apostles in it. Somebody asked me today, another minister said, what are we going to do? What is going to bring us together in unity? And my answer to him was, we will not come into unity, complete unity. Um, and if we continue in the same way that we're, what we're doing, we are waiting on the Lord's coming. And uh, of course, uh, I teach that the Lord's coming is multifold. Uh, he's not coming for his bride all at once. He's first coming to the church in a restored church. And I certainly believe through a pro, an apostolic ministry. That's what's going to bring us into unity is an apostolic ministry that has God's backing, the authority and power and demonstration of the spirit that had all the power that the apostles of the early church had. And that will bring us into unity. Once these men and God gives them. Remember what Jesus told those men. He said, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whosoever sins you remit, they'll be remitted. Whosoever you retain will be retained. Those men were powerful men, uh, but they had to be men that God could trust. Jesus, he came and and he personally, individually trained those 12 men as apostles. He didn't just uh, train those men up, uh, but, and then just leave uh, and die on the cross. But after his resurrection, he didn't go back to heaven right away. He first went to his apostles. The first thing, the last thing he told them before he died was to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There was going to be a comforter, he said, 
in St. John 14, 15, 16, and 17, the context of those chapters is Jesus teaching his disciples that he was sending a comforter, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> I'm sure they didn't understand it fully in the 14th chapter of St. John. He told them that the, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he said, he's been with you, but he shall be in you. That this, this comforter of the Holy Ghost, he said, in that day, you will know that I am in my father and he's in me and that my father and I are in you. Uh, he said in the 23rd verse, I believe it is of St. John, he said, uh, uh, me and my father will come and make our abode with you. That word abode means it's um, that word uh, is the word Greek word mone, and uh, it it's the exact same Greek word that was translated mansions. Uh, in the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He wasn't saying that where I'm at in heaven, you, you will be in heaven also. He was saying where I am right now, while I'm talking to you, uh, you'll be in the same place uh, because... <laughs> he was sending the comforter, the Holy Ghost, which would be in them. And that new birth, that new man, that being born again of God's nature. See, Jesus was born of God as a human. Here on the earth, he was born of the Virgin Mary. And he didn't have to be born again because he came from heaven, reduced to a seed, born as a human. That's what God did for us. He sent his son in human form to experience uh, the second chapter of Hebrews tells us that he was tempted in all points as we are. See, Jesus went through the human life. He took not on himself the nature of angels, second chapter of Hebrews, but he took on himself the seed of Abraham um, uh, so that he could die. He couldn't have died as an angel, but uh, as or having celestial divine nature in heaven. But when he came here and became a human to be made like one of his brethren so that he would go through what we are going through, like the first Adam, a human nature, and overcome his own will to do the will of the Father and not sin. Jesus was tempted, but he never gave in to it and he never sinned. He had advantage over you and I, saints. Don't get to thinking, you know, if he could do it, I could do it. Uh, you can, but you, you're you going to have to have all the help that he had. And that, in my opinion, is going to take a restored church. Uh, Jesus... Uh, he was a human, but he was born of God, and uh, God had a special calling on him, and God had an obligation to him. That was his father, and God spoke to him directly. God had angels speak to him. Uh, you know, the, the disciples thought one time that he just uh, uh, it thundered in heaven, but Jesus heard the voice of his father talking to him. And so uh, uh, God, God dealt with Jesus, yet he still had to walk by faith, even though God helped him in many ways. But look, Jesus helped the apostles in many ways. After his death, I was going to go on to tell you when Jesus died and resurrected, he went not to heaven, but he went first to the house where his apostles were staying. And he breathed on every one of them and said to them, receive ye 
the Holy Ghost. That's how important it was. And Jesus knew that his purpose for coming to this world, not only to establish the new covenant, but to establish that you and I could be born again of God's nature. See, when Adam, Adam was born of God, but, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call and set this where we won't do that again. Um, Adam was born of that uh, as a human, and he had the power. He had the power and the knowledge in the, in the garden uh, not to fall, but to live above sin. I mean, one sin caused him to lose his place in God and to be uh, removed from the garden. And uh, so... Uh, Jesus was the second Adam, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and he, how did the psalmist say? He came to restore that that he took not away. Adam took it away. Adam fell and all of us were born of Adam, not of God. That's why it's important that we be born again. Like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, he didn't understand that, you know. He he didn't understand how a six foot man could be born of a woman again that was just five foot four, say. We don't know. I don't know how tall she was, but uh, you get the point that he, he he didn't know how he could be born again as a grown man. But he didn't understand that it meant being born of God's nature which is what the baptism of the Holy Ghost accomplishes in all of us that receive it. We are born of God's nature. Paul called it the new man. He called it the inward man. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, once we're born of that, that nature, Jesus said, I mentioned earlier, when he said, he has been with you, but he shall be in you the Spirit of God, the Father. Uh, that's what the Holy Ghost is. It is the Spirit of God Almighty, the Father. It's his life. It's who he is. It's his Spirit, the Spirit of life that was in Christ, like Jesus said, my Father is in me and I in him. If you think the Holy Ghost is a person, you would certainly think Jesus would have mentioned him there in the 14th chapter of St. John, but the truth of the matter is, it's God the Father and his son Jesus, and the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father that's in Jesus. And so, uh, uh, and when he is in us, we're born of his nature, his spirit. He imparts his spirit to us in, in a nature. And so there's a nature of God that we, but we also have a human nature, which is an, our nature is an Adamic nature, even though God, see, God made Adam a human, but that human was born of God's nature. He had God's nature and he had a human nature. But when Adam fell, his nature was corrupted. And so we're all of a corrupted human nature, which we call the Adamic nature. But since we've been born again of God, we have two natures, the human nature, it's a fallen nature from Adam, and we have God's nature. And we have to be, uh, we've got to mature in God's nature and we have to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit of God. The, the wonderful spirit of God will help us to overcome the human nature. Jesus overcame the human nature even though he wasn't fallen. He didn't have any Adam in him. He was a human, but he was born of God. And, but he did suffer temptation like Adam did, but he didn't give in to it. He didn't ever fall. And so uh, 
that that's uh, I think it's very important for us to understand that we've been born again of God's nature and we are a new creature. We're a new creation. And so we have to be, what does it say in, in, uh, in the book of, um, let's see what scripture I want to go to. Um, maybe in the book of Romans. Um, we want to be a born in the, in the, um, Okay, let's let's see if we can just uh, read a little bit here in the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, verse. Uh, let's start in the fourth verse. It says uh, Romans eight and four that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh or the human nature fallen. Of, of Adam's fall, but after the spirit, after that we've been born of God's nature, we're having to learn how to walk after that, uh, after the leading of the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He, what he's saying is, is that if you've been born again of God's nature and Christ is in you, it, it looks like that God uh, created his son. In fact, we have enough scripture to prove that he did create his son and his son created everything else. His son created Adam and Eve, the angels in heaven. Uh, the, just read the second chapter of Corinthians, first chapter of uh, Hebrews. Um, uh, he, he is the beginning of God's creation. God created Jesus and he created everything else that was created. And, um, so it looks like that God, in fact, most of the scriptures in the New Testament is, is Jesus. He was the God of the Old Testament as the word of God, doing the will of God and accomplishing what God sent him to do. It was God in Christ. It was of God, but by Jesus Christ, Paul said. Well, uh, if Christ be in you, the body uh, the, the, this human body, its works, the operation of, of the human body is dead. In other words, once we're born again, we're not doing the deeds of the flesh, but, but our body, we're, we're keeping our body under, under the, uh, submission of God and the body of, of the Adamic nature doesn't, can't function, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So in, in, in the way that uh, 
the spirit raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. And if that spirit, the spirit of God, the father, his nature, if it dwells in us, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. Notice it says mortal, that's mortality. That's not immortal. So God will have to raise us up. See, we're, we're, uh, death is overshadowing us because of the sins of Adam and the sins of man. We're sold under sin, but once we've been born again of God and we serve God like Jesus did and the way God resurrected him, God will, he will quicken your mortal body uh, and God, you will live. Let's read a little further. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But ye through the spirit, if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. So uh, I was talking to a minister just this, as a matter of fact, it was today. And he was telling me about a man that had a dream that he was in a, he, he came to his church. This was a pastor. He came to his church and he saw this man was sitting in a seat of authority, this pastor. And this pastor fell over in the floor. And this man ran to him and tried to do CPR on him and tried to help him. And he kept asking the congregation to help him, but no one in the congregation would help him. And we were talking about this man's dream. This man was, was from Babylon. He did not have an understanding in the body of Christ. Uh, he, you know, was from a different Pentecostal group. And um, he was trying to get this pastor to give over to a lot of Babylonian ways. And uh, I was telling this pastor, I said, that dream that man saw that you were mortifying the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. He saw that you were living a crucified life. But to him, you were, you were dead, which is what the scriptures tell us. We have to die out to Adam and to the, to the human nature, or that is the will of the human nature. Uh, I might say something right here about about chaff. But before I do, let me finish this little dream. I told him, I said, that man was trying to resurrect the flesh in you. He didn't want you living a crucified life. See, when you live that kind of life, it brings condemnation on others. But there is no condemnation in them that walk after the Spirit. Paul starts off in this chapter telling. And so, uh, so uh, this, this man was having uh, a lot of trouble <laughs> trying to understand why no one would help him. Well, that man's congregation knew that well, we're not gonna help you try to resurrect the flesh in him. <laughs> we're, all working on, we're all working on the same thing to overcome the flesh. And um, so, <clears throat> So verse 15 says, for you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. What a scripture that you and I have received the spirit of adoption through this new birth, that we're able to cry, Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord, oh God, that I've been born of you. Uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, he that, um, how does it say that? Um, he that um, is tender, something to that extent, tender to a servant, um, shall have him as a son at the length. 
See, right now we're we're servants of the Lord. We have to understand to humble ourselves, to come under his authority, to understand God's purpose that was in Christ and that he's to be our head. Like I was saying earlier about Christ's headship. Christ is the head of every man in this way. It's like, you know, I think maybe the best way to explain it would be like a CEO of a corporation. You may work for a corporation and you may not have very much of a relationship with that CEO as far as getting your direct orders from him. But he delegates it. It, it, it's handed down and delegated authority. And whatever department you are in, the head of that department or the, the one in charge of that department, see, his authority trickles back to the CEO. That stands for chief um, CEO. What's that? Chief executive officer. Je Jesus is our chief executive officer. But he hands this down through, firstly, in the early church, he handed it down to apostles. Then the apostles gave it to the other ministry. I've often said the thumb, we know the hand of God. Peter said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We know that's the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors and evangelists. But this apostle, you know, I was saying to somebody the other day, look, look, that apostle can cover all five gifts because he has all five of them. And that apostle, these are the extensions of that apostle. He, God gives him ministers, specialists to work in, in each gift prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. And some men have more than one gift. Some men may be an evangelist and a pastor or a teacher and a pastor. Um, a lot of times prophets, they may have more than one gift, but the order was apostles, prophets, and teachers. And we know pastors and, and evangelists, even though the prophet and evangelist is a little bit in most cases, um, those gifts under the early church seem to be a little bit more remote that God would send them out. You know, he sent Philip out to Samaria. Uh, you know, there, there were apostles, prophets that were, that were sent out to do a job. But when you look at the apostle Paul, I think he's an example of a New Testament apostle. He started out, he started out as an evangelist. Now, I don't think every gift works this way, but I think an apostle does. The, the apostle Paul started out as an evangelist. When he went on his missionary journey, he'd go out and evangelize. And, um, and I teach that the seven spirits of God is God the Father, which is the spirit of the Lord. Then Jesus wisdom, then understanding, an apostle, then the fear of God, a prophet, then uh, knowledge, a spirit of knowledge, a teacher, then counsel, the spirit of a pastor, then might, an evangelist. Should have raised this hand and then this one for the might. A lot of people don't see the evangelist, but if you look at evangelists of the early church, look what Philip did when he went into Samaria. He turned that city upside down. He did many miracles. Um, he, he done many, many healings. The power and demonstration of the Spirit of God was in that evangelist, and that was the spirit of might, the strength and power of God that worked. Paul, when he went into an area and he began to, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, he did many miracles. He did healings the power and demonstration of the Spirit was with him to bear witness that he was sent of God. And when he gathered people together there and touched them and they received Jesus Christ, he had an obligation to them. 
he wooed that woman and he married her, so to speak. He became the, the husband or the shepherd over that church. He became the pastor, a shepherd, and he shepherded those people. He, uh, you know, uh, he was responsible for her, for that woman, that little church. But then she brought four children. When she brought four children and for him and her and the children, he had to be a breadwinner. Spiritually, he had to feed that family spiritual food. He had to be a pastor. He had to counsel them in the ways of God, in the word of God, and give them God's counsel. So he was teaching them. He was not only a pastor that he gave them counsel, but he also had to teach. He had to develop as a teacher to teach the word of God and the ways of God to that church. But as she grew, as those children grew, just like in the natural, when a man marries a woman and has children, and you know he can just feed them while they're little kids. But when they get up, Teenagers, they get up big enough to where he can see they're going to leave home before long. And when he sees that, he realizes these children have to be prepared for the future. They've got to know what they're going to be facing out here. That's the gift of an, a prophet. A prophet, that's the fear of God. They have to have the fear of life itself and fear of authority and what they're going to meet out in life, and what the future holds, what they can expect. That's a prophet shows the future. Finally, the apostle Paul developed enough churches that God gave him elders in every city. He placed them in his pastors. He, he had men that were evangelists. He had men that were teachers and prophets, and those men worked under Paul's ministry. That was an extension of his ministry. Don't tell me that we don't need that down here. We certainly do. And a lot of people may not want, you know, a man to be an authority over their life. But look, let me let me show you something. Um, let's look in James. I want to show you an apostle of the early church. Um Let's look at uh, James, the third chapter and the 17th verse. The 17th verse says, wisdom that is from above is first pure. See, God is going to have men that are of a pure heart. I was saying earlier that... Uh, Jesus trained those men up. He's not coming back down here to personally train up apostles. But these men of God in the body of Christ are going through a, a training, a training course. God's getting men ready that he can trust. God's worked on this ministry for over a hundred years and he'll choose out men that are trustworthy men that God can give them the keys to the kingdom and God will bind whatever they bind. He'll bind it in heaven, what's bound on earth. He'll loosen heaven, what's looped on earth. God will back up their authority, but these men will be pure. They will have no, no ulterior motive. No, they will have crucified pride in their life. Pride is a selfish spirit. That's something we can't have in the body of Christ. We have to be thankful, but not proud. No, you cannot be proud. You can only be thankful. Wisdom that's from above is first pure, and then it's peaceable. See, it's easy to work under a man that you know that he is pure, his motive's pure. If he, if he even gets on to you about something, you'll know it's because he loves you, the way he does it. The, the spirit of God that backs him up and how he goes about it. He's gentle. He's gentle. Even if he has to 
correct you and easy to be entreated. See, he's not a man that you, you know, feel like he's in this for himself, but you'll know it's easy for me to entreat this man because he's out for my good. He's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality. He doesn't play, he doesn't play uh, favorites and without hypocrisy. He doesn't claim to be something that he's not. He doesn't uh, propose to have any power of him own self. And the fruit of light righteousness is sown of them that make peace. He, that Does that sound like the Apostle Paul? It does to me. Oh, yes, we'll have an, we'll have an apostolic ministry down here. I was going to say earlier, the Apostle Paul... He finally gained and an, he built, God built in him an administration that was his administration. Well, there's men today that think they're, may, 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 may think they're apostles and not be. There is such a thing as a false apostle. <laughs> what did the Lord, one of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia, and the Lord told that church, he said, you have tried them that say they are apostles and are not. So a man can say he's an apostle, but I don't make him an apostle. In fact, saying it isn't going to do anything, but the works being there. I understand Paul mentioned he was an apostle. I don't think there was anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with a true apostle declaring that he is one. But uh, I think we would all have to admit that we do not have even though we have a five-fold ministry today, I'd have to say it's in part. I'd have to say that we do not have a five-fold ministry working in the same manner that the early church ministry worked in. I think they were in a second heaven condition, a restored con church condition, paradise. I think that's what paradise is. Uh, you look in Joel, the second chapter with me. I will tell you, when I got on here, I, I had no intention whatsoever talking about this, but it just seemed like it, it came to me. So I think it's what the Lord wanted me to talk about. Honestly, I do. So here in the second chapter, this second chapter of Joel is a prophecy. If you remember the apostle Paul, I mean, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, remember what he said? This is that that was spoken of by the apostle, uh, by Joel, the prophet Joel. In the last days, you know, uh, he began to, to tell that, that it was being fulfilled right there, uh, that he'd pour out his spirit on all flesh. Well, here's what he said about them. Uh, let me find the scripture here that I'm wanting. Okay, it's in the third verse. It says, a, a fire devoureth before them. That's judgment. And behind them a flame burneth. That's still judgment. And the land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them is a desolate wilderness. Yea, a nothing shall escape them. <clears throat> before them, the land is as the Garden of Eden. That was paradise. See, the early church was going into paradise. That's what was before them. But behind them was a desolate wilderness. That was the church when it fell away. I was telling someone today, I said, if a, if a person doesn't understand that the New Testament church fell away and went into darkness and that it has to be restored, then they are at a loss as to understanding God's purpose and, and how God is working today in the Gentile world. That early, that, that, that uh, Jewish ministry back there was 
Uh, that ministry was uh, received on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ dwelt in them and they harvested that world. And uh, when God finished with that, he did include the Gentiles in it. Uh, by the apostle Peter opening uh, the, the household of Cornelius, adding them to the body of Christ, them being born of the Holy Ghost. When Peter went and spoke to them, the angel, if you remember, that was an act of God. God, told, God sent an angel to tell Cornelius to send men to Simon the Tanner's house to find a man by the name of Peter. Of course, God dealt with him about, you know, he was up on top of a house. God gave him a vision, a big uh, sheet laid down from heaven with all kinds of unleavened, uh, not unleavened, but unclean animals in it. And God spoke to uh, Peter and said, rise and eat. Peter, that confused Peter. He didn't know. I'm sure he was wondering if that was really God talking to him. He said, Lord, you know I have never had an unclean thing in my mouth. And, and God took the sheet back up and then it came back down. He opened it back up. And there was all those unclean animals. God said, rise and eat. Right at that time, the door, somebody was at the door and it was those men from Cornelius' house that an angel had told, told Cornelius, send those men and ask for Peter to come and talk to you. Tell them an angel of God sent you. And so Peter, he went to Cornelius' house and he didn't know what he was supposed to do. He just started talking to him about Jesus. And while he was talking, the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and his whole household. And they began to speak in tongues and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Peter said, can we refuse water seeing they have received the same spirit that we've received? And so they baptized them in water and that opened the door to the Gentiles. And uh, then, of course, later God called the Apostle Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the chief apostle among the Jews. He couldn't handle all of that. And so God called Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he began to work with the Gentiles back there. And it, it opened the door, and he planted... And I'm sure that some of the Gentiles that came in back there made the bride. But for the most part, the Gentile world was just a, a, a very small amount that came in back there. When those apostles went off the scene, the church fell away. The picture of that is in the, uh, what is it, in the sixth chapter of the book of fifth and sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter showed the horses, the seals, seven seals. And the first four was, the first one was white horse, uh, white horses, in fact, right here in the uh, in Joel too, but it's not the only place. You could use Zechariah in different places, but uh, in prophecy, horses represent the church right here in the same place. Um the very next verse, a fire defied before them, behind them a flame burneth, and the land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them is a desolate wilderness, and nothing will escape them. That is back there. They judged everything back there. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. See, that, that horses is a picture or of the appearance of the church that he was prophesying, Joel was prophesying of the New Testament church that started on the day of Pentecost, and their appearance was as horses. Well, the white horse was a white the color of righteousness, and so that white horse represented that early church. The rider uh, had a bow in his hand, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That was Jesus. He was the rider of the white horse, or the head of the New Testament church. But then the second seal opened and it was a red horse. And the rider on that horse had a sword in his hand and power was given unto him to hurt men. 
that is a Pentecostal type era. Red is the color of sin. Sinner entered into the church. The church began to fall away. And so the rider of that horse, it was a Pentecostal era. People still had the Holy Ghost, but they didn't have, uh, but the rider changed. See, the, the church, that authority in the church, the sword, they had the sword, which was the word of God, but power was given to them to hurt men. Well, you know, you could, you could take this down here. We always have taught that even though the church fell from the white horse, to the red horse, to the black horse, ignorance, lack of knowledge, finally to a pale horse, death. And then for the church to be restored, we got to, we first had to come back to a black horse, the Protestant movement. Uh, ignorance, not too much knowledge, but then a red horse, a Pentecostal era, Protestantism, then Pentecostalism. Finally, back to a white horse. Finally, we got to get back to the white horse in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. We see Jesus riding on a white horse and they that were with him were on white horses. So uh, we see that the white horse is coming back. But anyway, to see the falling away of the church, that red horse rider, there he had power to hurt men. See, when you have the word of God to a, an extent that it gives you authority, yet you don't have wisdom. You don't know how many people has been hurt how many people's been victims of damage that were done by men, men of God. You say, why did God let that happen? Well, God, that's all God had. God had to work with what he had and develop it. And God had men that didn't have wisdom, but he had to work with them, be patient with them. As a matter of fact, God started out in the Catholic church with the Reformation. It was a lot worse than the Red Horse era. Death was in that. But he finally gathered some men out of that and started the Reformation like Martin Luther. And the Protestantism, Protestantism started, but their knowledge was limited. And God had to work with men like that until he could develop them further. I don't think God necessarily ordained them to have a organization, but they organized like the Catholic Church did. See, the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, and I'll just, you know, it said, it uses a different word, but it says, the angel told John, said, come here and I'll show you the judgment of the harlot, the mother of harlots, uh, it says in that chapter. Uh, so she had daughters. And that's a picture of the Catholic Church. And then the organizations that followed her, they, they got something from their mother that gave them the same spirit. They were like her in the fact that they organized man's ways, not God's ways. Organizations, certainly not the order of the New Testament church. But I think God allowed that because our forefathers were coming out of a dictatorial system, religious system, man-made and in confusion. And I think God allowed a democratic government to be set up in these organizations to protect the people for a time. And so I think God allowed that. But finally, the Lord uh, began to talk to a man like William Souders and help him to understand that there was going to be one body and there was going to be a church like the early church, a restored church. See, if we go to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, the angel showed John, he said, take a read and measure, like unto a rod, and measure the temple and all that's there. Me measure the temple and those that worship therein. We got to know, we got to know something about these people. 
we've got to know something about the temple. And that's not, wasn't talking about the natural temple. It was talking about the spiritual temple. See, it was no longer had to do with a natural building, but had to do with the people of God that housed the spirit of God, and they were the temple of God. But he said the outer court, see that the, the natural temple was a picture, had meaning, but he said the outer court, leave it out. You don't have to measure that. He said that's for the Gentiles to trot underfoot for 42 months or 1,203 score days, which is prophetically 1,260 years. And that's ex exactly how long the Catholic church ruled the church. And so... But, but see, the, the two witnesses, they lay dead in the streets for that same period of time. The Old and New Testament, it, it, it prophesied in sackcloth and ashes in a humbled state. Uh, it couldn't operate. It was in a, the rider of that white horse, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of the pale horse was death and hell followed with it. That's not talking about a burning hell. It's talking about a religious hell. Tataru, that was talking about a religious condition that imprisoned people. And so, um, but finally, after three and a half days, uh, or, or 42 months, or 1260 years, what that prophetically stands for, after that, uh, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to these two witnesses which is the Old New Testament, and it was to the people, the men of God that were reformers, that God has brought us in reformation down here. That restored church, it said, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's talking about the restored church or this paradise. We are going back to a paradise state. What's before us is Eden, just like we got to get back in it. So you remember when God kicked Adam out, he put two cherubims as those two witnesses and a flaming sword turning in every direction. He said, now least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live. That's a picture, saints. Adam could have got back in the garden just by walking around that. There wasn't a fence. There wasn't a wall but there's a picture in that. He couldn't get back in the same relationship with God. We have to get back where Adam was and where the early church was, where we have a sevenfold light. That's what I was going to say a little bit earlier about this ministry. See, we're not living in that holy place yet. I don't see us there, but we have a mediator, Jesus, our apostle of the faith, our shepherd, our great shepherd. And he is, he is, he's gave us gifts of the spirit of God, but we're not dwelling in the place where it can operate like it did in the early church. We get that restored church back. We will be walking in a sevenfold light. See, if we had a sevenfold light, there wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be any uh, misunderstandings in the body of Christ of our doctrine. We're still working on it, and the reason we are is because we don't have that sevenfold light in its complete form yet. But God, when God gets us restored, we will be there, and we will have that. And so, let's keep going. What do you say? Let's keep asking God to help us. It's the, I know it's, I've read the end of the book, the back of the book, and I know how it's going to turn out. Jesus is going to have his way. He is going to make up the remainder of his bride. And if we will, if we will take our part, like the type that's in the little book of Esther, that's a type of the church down here. We are, Mordecai I said to Esther, you remember what happened? Haman wanted to kill all the Jews in the land. 
Did y'all know before this is over with, they're going to try to stop the dragon system will try to stop the people of God. He, The dragon has went to make war with her seed, that early church's seed. And they're going to do everything within their power to destroy this body of Christ. Remember what Mordecai told her? He said, Esther, it just may be that God has chose you to be queen for this very reason. He was trying to get her to go talk to the king. She said, if I go in there and I'm not accepted, I will be killed if the king don't hold out his golden scepter. Thank God. Saints, let me tell you something. We're going to gain enough faith to step in before our Savior, Jesus Christ, and such a holy place that we'd lose our lives if we got in a place that we didn't belong, unless he held out the golden scepter. My God in heaven, he's going to hold out the golden scepter before us and say, what is it that you want, queen? Hallelujah. We just for this purpose is why we are called to save the people of God in the body of Christ and to make up the remainder of his bride. Praise his wonderful name. Well, it's just good tonight to be, uh, have you, your audience, your ear tonight. We appreciate all of you. Here, Brother Painter, give me that scripture in Proverbs 29, 21. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. I believe you can look at that more than one way. I think that we are Jesus's servant. He's bringing us up from a, from a child and he will have us as a son at the link. I also believe that a man of God will raise up ministers under him and, uh, and do it delicately, delicately drill with those pastors. They may serve him, but in the end, they'll become his sons in the gospel. In type, I'm saying. And so I think that's a very uh, important uh, uh, scripture. Uh, I believe brother, it's probably Brother Elias that gave the scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, and showing that... Um, uh, that um, Christ is the head of every man. Again, the way he's the way he's been my head is the leaders of the body of Jesus Christ have heard from him and I've received from them the great things that God gave them. And now I'm getting old and God's, uh, I'm trying to help men like men helped me when I was young. And um, so I try to help men to hear hear from God and to help them know God's ways. I, I ought to be somewhat experienced in God's ways. I've been serving him in this ministry for a long time. And so we're trying to let Christ rule in the kingdom of God. All right. Uh, thank you all for the scriptures. Uh, brother, brother Paul, Brother David Paul from Montreal. It's good to have you, Brother Paul with us here tonight. Brother Pacheco from the Philippines. God bless your heart. Brother Pacheco, we, we appreciate having you with us. We pray that everything's going good in the Philippines. We love Brother and Sister Peach and the work they're doing over there. We appreciated Brother Martin Baxter and his uh, opening that work up over there and that we've got people in the body of Christ so many places now and so many different countries. We're thankful for that. Um, God bless your hearts. We appreciate every one of you. Um, Brother Zacharias Mateo in the Dominican Republic. I see he's on here. Sister Betty Layton, of course, the local people. Appreciate having y'all with us, all of you tonight. Praise God. Oh, Lamb of God, we give you praise tonight. We're thankful for your goodness. Touch your people, oh God. Lead 
direct and help them, oh God. Remember Brother Phil Fisher and Sister Chelsea Fisher's little baby, Mallory. She's in the hospital 10 days after birth. She's still in the hospital. I believe she's still on the vent and they're desperately trying to, to help this child and get its life stabilized. So if you would pray for Brother and Sister Fisher, Phil and Chelsea Fisher, their little baby, uh, Mallory. Uh, pray for the church here in Little Rock. Pray for the Dominican Republic. Pray for the work in Mexico and Brother John Bud's works. He uh, passed here uh, last September, wasn't it? Just don't seem like it's been that long, but uh, what's it, such a precious and dear friend of mine. And I love loved Brother Bud and I love his works. And I pray for them. And so help us to pray for these needs. We have a sister in our church, Sister Abraham, that's been in the hospital and and uh, has a condition in her body. And she sure needs God's touch on her life. So remember her in your prayers. My son, Michael and Cindy Smith, both had COVID uh, two weeks ago, but they are over it. They didn't have a serious bout with it, but they you know, had some lingering, I uh, think Michael's over it, but Cindy's had a sinus infection afterwards. And so the doctor gave her some antibiotics for that, but she's, she's doing good. But keep praying for their full recovery and um, keep praying for Brother Weiser uh, in McAllister, the pastor there in, in uh, McAllister, Oklahoma. That's where I was born. And and spent several of my young uh, elementary days there in McAllister. Of course, my family's from Oklahoma. And so that, you know, city means a lot to me. Of course, he lost his wife with COVID um, here this month, buried her. And so pray for the church there in McAllister. She was a precious sister. And Brother, Brother Weiser is a precious Precious brother and pastor in the body of Christ, so pray for him. That's certainly a difficult time for any man to go through. I believe he's in his 80s. I think they were like, gee, he's still alive. I think she was 84, I believe. Anyway, um, it's hard to lose a spouse after you've been together that long. So remember them. Remember our brother, Brother Gary Wright in, in Humble, Texas. He He's doing so much better than we ever in, in, imagined, but he is, uh, uh, you know, he's still having to take treatments for uh, the cancer that he had, keeping it into remission. So I think we should keep men like that in our prayers. Uh, so pray for me, and I certainly will pray for you. God bless your hearts. Uh, the local church here, I don't know. They're talking about snow possibly uh, Sunday. So I don't know. Or in the freezing rain and we're going to watch the weather and we'll see whether or not we're able to have, have service. We'll watch it close and we'll certainly let everyone know. I hope that, uh, I hope that it, it holds off till Monday where we can have church Sunday. I miss not being together with the people of God. I love you. God bless your hearts. Have a good night. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Good night. Amen.